I feel quite uh, humbled to be included with many of the minds that have been on this stage, you guys. You've been very fantastic. Thank you. Everyone loves a good bad guy, at least, that, that, at least when it comes to film and television. The way in which antagonists were written decades ago has changed drastically over the years, venturing from well-delineated lines of good and evil and shifting more toward moral ambiguity. But how does this apply to real-life fallen heroes? There was a time when the morality of a character in pop culture was reflected, usually, in their appearance. We like to compartmentalize things so that they make sense to us. It's easier to digest. The Wicked Witch of the West, Emperor Palpatine, the classic incarnation of Igor. In classic pop culture, being ugly on the inside meant being ugly on the outside, and being good on the inside meant being good on the outside. Perhaps this was more reminiscent of a time when life was lived in black and white, with very little room for gray areas. Letting in the gray areas meant letting in change, and change is terrifying to those who do not wish to embrace it. Women could earn maybe 60% of what men did because their place was in the home, and that was that. Black people couldn't mix with white people because someone had the crazy notion that for some reason, that would be bad, and that was that. And homosexuality, it wasn't even decriminalized in Canada until 1969. There were clear cut lines regarding women, ethnic minorities, and homosexuals, and to suggest that those lines be changed or removed meant that you were a radical. But as we trundled into postmodern times, we came to realize that humans as sentient beings do not boil down to yeses and nos. The gray areas matter. Change matters, and being progressive matters. Embracing change, being open-minded, and having a fuller understanding of who we are as human beings has had a tremendous impact on our pop culture. Contemporary pop culture often takes the gray areas into consideration when creating iconic characters with the understanding that human beings are complex. There is inclusiveness with the good, the bad, the ugly, the ambiguous, the confused, the right, the wrong, the grotesque, the beautiful, and everything in between. Oftentimes the protagonists aren't solely good, nor are the antagonists solely bad. Antagonists in particular are being afforded more sympathy from the viewer than in previous decades. Walter White in Breaking Bad, he is a father, a husband, a teacher, an intelligent person who does or did arguably have a good side, also not ugly. Regina, the evil queen in Once Upon a Time, revels in her evil nature, but is a tremendously sympathetic character despite previous transgressions, also not ugly. Hannibal Lecter in the recent series and in other incarnations, cook, psychiatrist, artist, gentleman, charmer, genius, also not ugly. We know and understand that these characters are evil, but through masterful storytelling and thorough character development, the lens with which we view them is much broader. We now like and occasionally sympathize with our enemies. We want Walter to give up making meth, to miraculously recover, and to go back to being a loving family man. But there is also an internal moral conflict because some of us, maybe just a little bit, want him to get away with it. We want Regina to one day find happiness even though she's responsible for killing hundreds of people. And despite the insidiousness of Hannibal's proclivity for human flesh, we kind of sort of maybe just a little want him to get away with it too because he's just that likable. And even though I'm a vegetarian, I would die to be invited to one of his dinner parties. These are characters that we can connect with, that we can relate to, that entice us because they are complex. There is good mixed with the bad. They are exaggerated versions of us. Hannibal is not just a killer. Regina is not just an evil queen. And Walter White is not just a meth cooker. When we encounter real life villains whose acts contradict what we know and love about them, it can create confusion in the media and in the public. Most people feel the need to either embrace the accusations or love their work, but many can't manage to do both. Accusations of sexual assault against Bill Cosby have been widely ignored until now because who wants to think of America's dad that way? The media isn't sure how to talk about Roman Polanski. Can we acknowledge his films are despicable, or sorry, acknowledge that his crimes are despicable while at the same time celebrating his films? In order to counter this confusion, we like to simplify things, especially when it comes to morality. For example, what comes to mind when you see an image of Gian Gomeshi, Alison Redford, or O.J. Simpson? Do we consider their careers, their families, and their experiences when we formulate opinions about them, or do we only consider the most protuberant information provided to us? A lifetime of decisions, good and bad, dis experiences, good and bad, relationships, good and bad, desires, genetics, influences, and yes, personal accountability, all contribute to who these people are and the decisions that they make. The acts committed, some of them allegedly, by these people are tangible. 
These acts are the lens through which we view our real life villains because that evil act trumps everything else that we know about them. We see our enemies as singularly evil, more akin to the Wicked Witch and Emperor Palpatine. And although our real life villains may not be physically unattractive, that's not for me to say, their act of villainy is now what defines them as people in the eyes of the public. Seeing the bigger picture about our villains does not necessarily make them more or less guilty for what they've allegedly done, and it doesn't necessarily make, make what they've done more or less terrible, it simply lends itself to a fuller perspective. Contrary to contemporary antagonists in pop culture, we view our real life villains with decisive evil. Similar to the Wicked Witch and Emperor Palpatine, the press presents an acute and laser focused view of who these people are. Moreover, it's easier for us to understand why someone would commit terrible acts once we put them into a box that we can package up and label. We often use words such as crazy, misogynist, liars, cheaters, thieves, etc. These labels can often be true, but they may not be the only label that is true. Contemporary pop culture, on the other hand, would perhaps choose to present the broader view, the families, the relationships, the memories, the experiences, the things that remind us that human beings, similar to some fictional characters, can commit terrible and unspeakable deeds while still maintaining an element of humanity. Several acts of sexual assault do not negate the fact that Gian was a successful CBC host, but it will overshadow it. But therein lay perhaps the greatest similarity between contemporary fictional enemies and real life enemies. As mentioned earlier, we often want our favorite fictional villains to keep doing what they're doing because that is what pushes the narrative. We like the story and we want it to keep going. In the end, however, the movie finishes, the director calls cut, everyone goes home. So what about our real life fallen heroes? Do we want the narrative to continue? I would hope that most of us would say no. I would hope that most of us would want accountability and justice. One of the many unfortunate things about real life fallen heroes is that there are some who would prefer the narrative to continue. They wish that the allegations against John were never made, even if it meant that women and continue to be assaulted, that Ms. Redford's indiscretions were never caught even if it meant that money continues to be spent, or that OJ was never brought to trial because God forbid your favorite football player be associated with something so terrible. There are those who would rather live without the knowledge that their heroes are flawed rather than have their pristine image of their hero disturbed. A broader example of this would be the current debate surrounding female gaming developers. Some gamers would rather see women harassed and driven from their homes rather than acknowledge that sexism in game, gaming does exist. Acknowledging this issue in the industry means that there could potentially be a disruption to the status quo, which means that there's a strong potential for change. And as we all know, for those who are resistant to change, change is scary, especially when it means acknowledging that just because someone is famous, it does not make them impervious to committing terrible deeds. Enemies are not always physically ugly, and there's always more going on than what meets the eye. Thank you.